Okay, I'm going to mute myself, uh, and Thomas can take over from here. Uh, welcome to the, the first developers meeting. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, and again, welcome everyone to this first developers meeting. This presentation will be fairly short. It's literally a handful of slides. And on some of the topics, we basically already touched base um, during looking at some of the merge requests earlier. Um, but I just want to look at a more formal way um, at the topic of a code review um, and also what, what I think um, should be our, our goals and our best practices. So uh, first of all, the, the goal for code review, as I see it or at what, what I'm looking at when I look at merge requests uh, for Inkscape, is first of all uh, the correctness. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, if code um, a merge request um, is not implementing what it's um, supposed to implement or what it says it implements, um, then that would basically already be a, um, a, a blocker and that has to be resolved. So looking at um, the correctness, does it do what it says it does? Um, and the next step is, um, is it robust? Um, the, it's very high chance that um, like the initial recipe, for example, to produce a bug, um, that that will pass that the, the developer uh, tested that, but then um, are there other inputs, um, are there maybe further related uh, features that could be affected here by this change and could potentially break? Um, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing, uh, given that everything is correct and there are no side effects, um, we should look at the code quality. Uh, we should always strive that the quality improves. Um, and that is uh, readability of the code, that is documentation. Uh, so when you add new functions, new methods, new classes, that you document them. Um, and that it's documentation that get actually picked up by uh, the code uh, documentation generator, which is Doxygen. Um, and finally, uh, unit tests, um, ideally every change should come with unit tests or already be covered by unit tests. Um, all right. So these were like the first things that came to my mind and what I'm typically looking at. And I want to throw in some um, that I found on the Wikipedia page. And that is, for example, knowledge transfer. Um, I think that applies very well. To the Inkscape project, we have a very diverse uh, group of developers, um, and there can be a lot of knowledge transfer. Uh, first of all, um, different levels of um, experience with, for example, C++ uh, or other technologies that we use. Um, so a reviewer can bring in knowledge, and the, the author who wrote the patch and wants to merge it can learn by getting good, good feedback. Um, but knowledge transfer can also go the other way around. Um, someone adds a feature, and if this is never code reviewed, at the point when it's, get, it's going to be merged, he might be the only person who was familiar with, with that feature. Um, and by going through code review, you're basically already um, making sure that more than one person has thought about this code and basically know what the purpose is, maybe know how it works. So we're already increasing the group of people uh, that's familiar uh, with a certain feature and a certain piece of code. Uh, and that basically bleeds already into the next bullet point here, um, the increased sense of uh, mutual responsibility. Um, so by reviewing and approving uh, a pull request or some code, um, you could in principle make um, accountable or responsible to some extent for this change. If you looked at it and you said, yes, this looks good, uh, this improves code quality and so on, um, you, you share some, some responsibility. And of course, it's, it's good um, that the project um, shares responsibility and 
ultimately has a higher confidence um, that this change was good um, and was an improvement. Um, another good bullet point here is finding better solutions. Um, a, a change could be correct, could even pass tests and everything, uh, but it might not be efficient or it might be too complex and there's a simpler solution um, and someone who has some knowledge in algorithms, for example, could immediately uh, point that out that there is uh, a simpler solution um, to achieve the same goal. And uh, simplicity, or let's say less complexity, is always better for a code base uh, because it makes it uh, easier to understand and easier to maintain. Okay. Um, the, the tools for code review is basically what we already looked at uh, an hour ago. Um, we have the GitLab platform, uh, which provides some excellent tools. I would I would say we never had um, that level of tooling. I mean, the Inkscape project exists for many, many years, has gone over several platforms, and I think GitLab is outstanding what we have, um, and we should really make use of that. So first of all, of course, we have merge requests. Um, the interface shows the code. You can comment line by line. Um, and um, you, for the primary Inkscape project, there is basically none of that um, is mandatory. For the extensions repository, it currently is mandatory. You can't merge without approval. Um, this is. It's just like it is at the moment. I mean, this is all up for discussion, but that's how it is at the moment. Um, but even if it's not mandatory, um, I would everyone, I would encourage everyone um, to uh, to get a code review on your code reviews, on your merge request, sorry, um, or the other way around. Make yourself available uh, to do code review, um, and that um, involves um, looking at the code. Of course, uh, you can comment line by line. Um, Martin already demonstrated that you can start writing comments and stage them for review. And then at the end, you can submit them all in bulk. Um, and the author of the merge requests will get a notification with a bunch of comments. Um, and once you've gone over the, the code and it looks good, or you've gone over some rounds of commenting and improvement, um, and you came to agreement that this can be merged, you can formally approve it. Again, it's not mandatory, but I think it's a very nice uh, formal way to show, again, that you share the responsibility for this change and uh, to give the author the confidence um, that um, yeah, others have approved it. For uh, the assessment of correctness, you actually don't even have to be a developer. Um, everyone can, um, can help here by just downloading the artifacts from the CI build. Um, and this is actually something we do a lot, um, in particular, if it's a pull request which fixes a bug, which has been reported by some person, we often ask the original reporter to test it on, on their platform. Um, in particular, if maybe the bug can only be reproduced in certain um, situations or environments. Okay, so as the author of a merge request, there's a lot you can do to actually make code review successful. Um, and there are, first of all, there are ways to write a patch that makes it unreviewable. And that includes patches which are just too large. If you're looking at thousands of lines of code, there's just no way someone can go over every line and assess its correctness. It's like looking for needles in haystacks. Um, and related to that is that often you're inclined to fix something, and then you look at the code and like, oh, this is like 10 years old. and it could be restructured. I could rename some variables. I could run blank format on this and stuff. So you're combining clean up, which is functionally invariant, with an actual fix. And that, again, makes it much harder to review because um, 
the reviewer wants to assess the correctness and that it has no side effects, but then he's logging all that noise of the cleanup. Um, and the simple solution here is to separate those. Do the, the fix in one merge request and ideally as minimal as possible. Like we look at one uh, code review, the first one that Martin pulled up uh, was one line, one line change. Um, so very easy to review. Um, you should be able to fully understand it, even though this one was, uh, Mark said he actually didn't understand it, but um, it, it, yeah, it wasn't obvious. But I, I understood what it did. I just yeah. understood okay. why the, origi the original problem happened. Yeah, okay, yeah, good point. But now imagine this came with like reformatting or other changes which just added 20 lines of noise. Um, then it would have been much less obvious that what Mark said, you understand what it does, but not why the original problem existed. So just separate those. You can first fix the problem, um, ideally add a test for it if applicable. And then after it's merged, you can do a follow up, pure cleanup, uh, and do your 20 or 200 lines of cleanup. Um, and it will be pure refactoring, should have no functional change. Uh, pass all the tests, of course, that exist. Um, and then again, it's easy to review um, if you know that the intent was not to change anything functionally. Um, and you should really only looking at um, stylistic or um, yeah, maybe renaming some, some variables and stuff like that. So, Tom, so Thomas, I have, a, I, have, I have an example of the, of the opposite of that, where I'm developing a feature Mm -hmm. And I, I I see a piece of code that either I do I, I need it to be refactored, or uh, I want it to be refactored, and it's in my mind now. For those instances, I've created a merge request of just those modifications, and I've gotten those in first, right? So the feature is mm -hmm. a long development cycle; it's going to take me a while to, to get it done. And instead of doing the cleanup afterwards, or, or, or combining some of the refactoring that I need within the within the request. I split it out and, and, and got it in beforehand because mm -hmm. just because I felt it would be easier to do it to, to chunk it up in that way. Would you would you re recommend that? It's absolutely fine. Um, I I didn't imply the the order here. Um, it's totally fine to first do the cleanup and then do your fix if that uh, is easier, of course. Um, as long as you separate it, I think that separation is very valuable. To, to make the changes reviewable by themselves because cleanup and fix is just very two very different purposes. But in which order you do them, I don't I don't care. Okay. But yeah, good that you pointed this out. Um, I actually do not imply uh, order uh, of the separation. Okay, I have another bullet point here. Um, no or insufficient description or no bug report. Um, so this is what I actually pointed out at Mark's um, Enum class pull request. It had no description. Um, so first of all, only someone who really knew why Enum classes are better would know uh, how, what to look for. That was the one thing. And the other one, there was actually a change beyond that. There was the unique pointer, which was correct, but it was not mentioned in any way, neither in the title nor in the description, which was completely lacking uh, or missing. So, um, and, and there also was um, no bug report, which in this case is fine. Refactoring does need a bug report or an issue, um, but basically every functional change should probably come with an issue. Uh, first, open an issue, describe the problem, maybe have someone verify it, uh, or if it's a feature request, uh, have others agree that this feature is actually desirable and then send your pull request with the change, which would in turn close uh, the ticket. I, I should also add that for feature requests, if it, especially if it's a user, um, user interface change or addition, uh, a, a request to the UX team is, is going to be profitable because at least they'll be able to look at it and, and walk through the, the workflows for you. Yeah. Um, so, um, and of course, Corresponding to the what to avoid, um, your good merge request will have a description which makes it clear what it changes. 
uh, link to the ticket, uh, the UX ticket, the, the issue, and whatever, the inbox or uh, the bug tracker. Um, so yeah, that just the reviewer knows what he's actually looking at and what he's actually supposed to evaluate here. Um, yeah. Challenging are large refactorings. Um, that's just the nature of them. Um, if you if your aim is to like kick up out some legacy GTK API and bring in some new um, GTK API, for example, um, we have several of those over the years. Um, it's going to be a lot of code change. It's probably not invariant in functionality. There will probably be. Um, some functional change uh, that you can't avoid. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the best thing you can do is to have good test coverage. The better the test coverage, the, the, the higher your confidence that you're not breaking things. Very general rule, but um, for these challenging refactorings and patches, um, that's even more important, I would say. Um, and Again, maybe try to split it into several patches um, that maybe it, get, it becomes reviewable. Um, it's, it's simply a size issue. Um, OK, uh, finally, there is a tricky point uh, with, with Clang format. We have not um, find, found agreement yet um, whether we should Clang format everything or not. Um, we have a CI job, which tells you um, if there would be changes with, with Clang format, and that often uh, suggests that you should actually Clang format everything. So I've seen several merge requests um, where it was like a few lines of change, but then I'm looking at 100 lines of change because someone Clang format the whole file. Um, that is just a, a tricky point right now because we have not, um, found, we haven't made up, up our mind, I would say. Um, what we actually expect. Um, it's an ongoing discussion as far as I can tell. Okay, um, so for the Inkscape project, um, aim, or let's say those are maybe my suggestions. Um, I would say ideally every merge request should get a review, um, which implies that devs need to make themselves available um, to, to do reviews. Um, and also maybe the, the author needs to be proactive and ping individuals uh, to get a review. Uh, also, if a dev sees the merge request but thinks, okay, I don't have time or I don't have the expertise because this touches whatever Python and I don't know Python or something like that, um, then just uh, delegate it to the next dev or leave a comment in the, in the dev chat um, and say, hey, there's a, a merge request that didn't get attention for three days, and I don't feel that I have the expertise to review it, but what do other things, uh, what do other people think? Um, so that, that it doesn't happen that things get stale, and also that um, someone who has push access to the repo doesn't just um, be discouraged, like, OK, no attention after two weeks, I'm just go ahead and merge it. Um, doesn't mean that bad things will happen. But I think if there is a, a code review, even a simple one, it's always better for the overall uh, health of our code base. And I, also what I wrote here, better short and honest review than no review. Um, so you can say, just say, OK, my expertise is, um, I need no C++ very well, and in terms of that, all these changes look good. Um, but I have no idea about life path effects, so I don't know about the functional change of this metric guest, for example. Um, so you could say, this is my level of expertise, and for that it looks good. Um, and this is definitely a, a helpful comment. OK, uh, that's my last slide. Um, there was a suggested discussion point related to all of that, and that's whether developers should take responsibility for bugs and merge requests. Um, and I think this will go into the, yeah, 
everyone yeah, onto, to in. onto the community. So this 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 discussion is primarily because, of course, in an open source pro project, um, nobody is required to give their labor to the pro project. But at the same time, if you uh, commit yourself to being able to produce a feature, you do also kind of make a compact that you are responsible to some degree for the code that you've made. Um, now, a lot of the time, this won't be the case because we have dri drive-by contributions, right? P people who just contribute a piece of code and then we never hear from them again. Um, so, so the question is, is like, what is the what is the, um, the both the responsibility and also the reward, right? For for pe people like Mark and Thomas um, uh, and Patrick who do like a lot of reviewing and a lot of the, the administrative work to make sure that contributors can can get their code in cleanly and, and look after the, some of the the back end tasks that really do keep Ink Inkscape as a code base ro rolling. Um, I'm interested to hear from other developers about what it is that they're looking for in terms of whether it's their pride or whether it's their uh, their attentiveness or whether they just want to make sure that the the pro project is is um, has all of the all, all of the attention that it needs in order to get uh, new contributors into the project like mentoring for, for, for instance um, yeah let's see so uh, Mantal says honestly the question is a tough nut to crack but I think the responsibility applies for the period uh, recent to the merge request. Fixing early bugs is important for things that, that don't show up imme immediately. I don't think that responsibility is a question. So I'll give, it, I'll give an example of the kind of like trickiness when it, when it comes to responsibilities. So um, in the extensions repository, there's an awful lot of code by an awful lot of developers over an, a long period of time. And the code quality was highly variable and of course we wanted to be able to refactor it as a project we had some problems we needed to get everything in python 3 but also we needed to move the python in, in a direction where we could actually maintain it in a, in a better way we did not have a sense of responsibility so like i could not go back to the original developers and and, and ask them hey can you come and 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 um you know, fix all of this code because some of it is very large and they may have been like 10 years since, since they last saw the code um, and so and so I found myself having to take responsibility for almost all of the code what, uh, in, in refactoring which means that I touched loads of it which means that today if you have a problem with the extensions the likelihood is is that I'm going to be the per person who will be responsible for at least code reviewing if not actually fi fixing it um, and of course, I haven't I haven't uh, got myself a job or, or anything, right? There's no there's no uh, payment for this responsibility. But I, but I feel it's important to be able to say, no, no, this code's not abandoned. This this is a this is a this code at least is maintained. Um, it's also when I say, for instance, that the G code tools, which is an extension that we have, is not maintained because that is something that's thousands of lines of Python, which I can't get into, like it's just impenetrable. And so to me, I, I don't feel it's my place to take responsibility for that code base specifically, simply because it's it's outside of my re remit. I can't test it very well. Uh, and I'm, I'm really looking for new contributors to be able to come in and help with that specifically. And, and in, in that case, it is about responsibility. Uh, Phil says, what about the prefer proverbial, proverbial hit by a boss? Even if a developer wants to take responsibility for, for bugs and merge requests, there could be reasons why this is impossible. The project should be prepared for this. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, we, we don't know what goes on in developers' lives. Um, there are lots of reasons why a developer can become unavailable. Um, but in terms of sort of like if you're an active contributor to Inkscape, is there a sense where we want people to... Um, for instance, do we want them to, to show that they are fixing bugs, right? Not just adding features, but they're actually committed to fixing bugs as well. Uh, for instance, when we ask people to join our Google Summer of Code, we ask them to contribute a couple of pa patches beforehand in order to be considered. And I feel like part of this is to show that they are uh, willing to dive into somebody else's problems, right? And, and, and try and fix issues that, that currently exist. And this is a good skill, I think, to have is to be able to go in and, and look at pieces of code that you may not have responsibility for, but you, you, you want to be able to fix the problem. Um, 
we tried this with the uh, with the one the one point release where we found ourselves in a position of having lots of bugs and not really a culture of fixing them, and so the organization of trying to prioritize problems. Uh, when we come to the team testing hack fest, I think it's August seventeenth, uh, but check check the listing. One of the issues that I'm going to be bringing up is how we uh, can prioritize like lists of problems that we need to give to developers to say, hey, the, these are the like the primary issues that we need to solve this week, month, year, release cycle, whatever the cadence is. Because there are definitely going to be times where developers themselves are so focused on features or so focused on their own area, but the project as a whole will have priorities uh, and maybe responsibilities. Um, Git blame can be used for historical lookup, but a shallow search will only show the main contributor. Uh, let's see, maybe, maybe that wasn't a question. From somebody who doesn't know the project's members very well, it's good to have the owners for certain areas that they can contact, mention, request feedback from when doing their first contributions. Also relevant for the book management team, uh, know whom to ping uh, when we're out of ideas for an issue. Yeah, th this is actually something that's cropped up, I think, at almost every single Hackfest that we've had, especially in per person, where we've talked about the idea of people at least being able to stand and say that they are responsible for certain areas. Um, there is a gentleman's agreement for some parts of the code. Like if there was a Windows building problem, Nobody's nobody's coming to me to ask for help, right? I'm the wrong per person. I don't have the skills or even the tools to be able to, to help. Um, but if somebody has an issue with extensions, I've definitely marked out that, that I'm the per first person to come, come to now. Um, and so partially it's like, what parts of the code do we feel comfortable in? I, 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 I honestly get the impression that at previous hack fests that we've had this discussion, it is the case that there are parts of the code base that simply do not have maintainers because they we do not have the um, people who are expert in that code. Either they wrote it or they've had significant experience. Um, I found this when I was doing the uh, I was editing signals for speed problems. Right, so I uh, during the the, the one point zero release, we were finding that like dragging objects around caused massive speed problems, and just tracking what code that went through. The signals code is like 13 years old. It's never been touched, right? The, the people who are would be responsible in this case, like you would say, oh, there's a signals issue, I'll talk to X. Those people are not involved in the project anymore. So um, in that case, we needed to grow again some, some new expertise to be able to, to tackle that issue. And so sometimes it does end up with, with it being a bit of a research problem. Uh, how are we doing for time? So we don't we don't really have a, a culture of pressuring each other. Uh, my friends at Red Hat suggest that Inkscape could learn to do more bartering, which is the idea that developers um, have a casual relationship of of saying, you know, I, I've reviewed your code, you re you've re re reviewed my code. As humans, I think we're uh, like automatically very good at knowing who in the project is contributing to our own um, work, right? So if we see, so when I see Mark review my code, that's a positive relationship, and I really, I really enjoy that. But when it comes to the project pressuring people to like work on bugs or um, fix specific issues or do merge requests, that's a tricky one. When, when it comes time to doing paid for developers, uh, like we, we actually have contracts for doing specific, th specific things, I think there will definitely be a case to be made for having set lists of items that uh, paid developers will work on. Right? So they, they will fix these bugs. They will work on these crashes. They will learn this area of code and become responsible for, for it. But I, I don't think we're quite at that area yet with, with the volunteers that, that we have currently.
Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually kind of impressed by the amount of code changes that have come in this year for, for like refactoring and cleaning and fixing. Like I think I think the code base is moving in the right direction when it comes to um, its general quality. I know we've been accused of in the past of uh, uh, mounting feature after fe feature without doing all of the necessary background work, but honestly, uh, the, the code base today I think is in a much better shape than it has been in the past. Thomas, I'm going to take control of the presentation. Yeah, ha hashtag no, no, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, hashtag signals, not just signals. Okay, so the, the final part of this team meeting is really to decide upon whether we should have frequent meetings or not, because uh, the dev team is now at the odd one out, I think, when it, when it comes to meetings. Uh, the board has meetings, and the uh, vectors team has meetings, and now the UX team will be having meetings. So the question is, should developers be getting together at a certain frequency to be having meetings? Um, and in fact, what I'll do is I'll create a poll for that, because I think, why not? We have the tools. Okay, so the question is, is should we have team team meet meetings? And if so, how fre frequently? Interestingly, I, I can't actually vote on this poll. No, My but you are, is... you are oh, the only on. one to, to, to be able to see what everyone voted. <laughs> that, that's, that is right, yeah. I can say that the vast majority of people so far have voted no opinion. Actually, it's not actually the vast majority. It just looks like a lot more because the text for no opinion is so much smaller. Okay, so we. It looks like uh, Pathpant and Javier uh, have not voted yet. And now we're just waiting for Javier. If he's, if Javier he's has a, a connection problem, so he will probably not answer. OK, so we'll, we can always ask him. Yeah, and he cannot someone. hear you. <laughs> OK. OK, so here we have the results. Uh, so there's a, there's a majority, I think, for a team meeting every month, seconded by a weekly, more ca casual meet, meeting. And absolutely nobody thinks that we should have no meetings at all. Uh, how many people is that that wanted them per quarter? Is that two? Excellent. Okay, so this what, this what is a what is a quarter? Oh, a quarter of a year. So it's three months. Sorry, I, I didn't realize that that wasn't a uh, universal time period. Like a tr trimester is more universally understood, I think. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that, that 
speaks as a more like a university thing or maybe a giving birth thing. Actually, wouldn't a trimester be five months of a year? No, six months of a year? Trimester is three months, it's in the name. I thought it was like three, like if you cut the year into three, that would be four months. No? No. Oh. Okay. It's semester for six months and trimester for three months. Yeah, in that scheme, yeah, that does that does make a lot, a lot of sense. Uh. <laughs> Every eight days. <laughs> Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to my task list to uh, ask for a meeting. So the question next is, who, who wants to uh, set up the next meeting? If, if, you, if you take responsibility today, you will be able to set the terms, which includes whether it should be conducted on IRC or whether it needs to be conducted through Big Blue Button. Your choices will be, will be cemented in the Inkscape law from, from now on. Cool, I do it then. Excellent. <laughs> Mark has volunteered to host the developer meeting. No, I, I, my uh, suggestion was to hold it every eight days so that if someone has a problem some day of the week, then it changes every time. It's uh, okay. We, we had that rule for an association some time ago, and it worked well because if someone said, I cannot on Thursday, then it's okay because only one in seven is on Thursday. And okay, so let's let's have that. Let's have that as a as a poll. So monthly. Uh, monthly. Eight, eight, I'm adding these as a po as poll options. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I think we should ask on the mailing list what the most active developers think. So. To my, but I don't know if Patrick is around. Or... Yeah, there's a couple of developers who are not here today uh, who will definitely be worth getting the um, getting getting feedback from. So we, we don't may necessarily have to decide on the periodicity right now. But... We don't. But but I am going to um, say that we have narrowed the the, the options down and uh, we should definitely be planning on a next meeting because there's high demand mm -hmm. so eight, eight day daily means that the the day shifts by one each meet, meeting so the first meeting it's on a tuesday then the next week it's on a wednesday yeah so far is there a way to create an icc calendar pro profile that does that <laughs> I, I think you can generate the content of icc files but i can write them I, by hand but i'm just like uh let's yeah i mean i will look in uh, Uh, in uh, Thunderbird, you have a custom repeat, which you can say every n days, and you can put eight. Excellent. What I think I might do is, if we if we end up having these things, I might uh, add these these ICC files as um, in, on the website, so people can just see. Oh, look, there's meetings every this, and then they can click on it and add to their calendars. Maybe we should have on the um, Inkscape website. Uh, uh, public calendar of which teams meet when yeah and at which time of the day yeah it's not it's not a very hard fun functionality because it's just it's like as long as you're not editing the calendars on the website the, then it's just the file it's just the icc files themselves and uh, you can even get some javascript wi widgets to show it on, on the website board meetings have a planned periodicity uh, i think vector meetings too and yep the, the vector could... meetings happen one week after the board ones but in my in my opinion, the dev meetings should be more light than board meetings. It's uh, I think I mentioned that two weeks ago that for me a dev meeting was just about telling uh, discussing about 
what issues should be t uh, are more interesting or more hard than thought and what is completely a priority or a big regression that was discovered during the week or things yeah. that are from the week the, the week before okay so the, mark can i ask you to, to do two things one is to set down what you just said into a list of uh, like the default agenda for each of the meet meetings right. and then to send a message to the Inkscape de developer mailing list to, about, with these mm -hmm. three options because I think that this uh, this is going to be really nice to have um, my my choice by the way is eighth day daily I've been convinced by by mark that that's a good option so it's five to three to one um. Yeah, and I have also attended, uh, well, uh, just uh, lurking on um, meetings from the Krita team and they meet uh, weekly. Oh, excellent. And, and it's just a discussion to... about uh, what they did during the week, especially for the paid members of the team. Yeah. Do they do they meet for half an hour or an hour, do, do you know? One, one hour, I think, maximum, oh, no. sometimes less. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that sounds like it's like people would just show up and then they'd talk about the like default agenda or, or whatever they, they needed to and then if, if they cut short then it's fine excellent so we have uh, six minutes I'm going to go back to the chat and see if there's any other questions so the traditional week uh, is eight days in Cameroon Oh, that's interesting. R Rene, when you when you say that all our data, data belong to us, are we collecting information? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They're all, all your base are belong to us. Okay, then we're, it's 15 minutes until the uh, the next part of the, the Hackfest. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this meeting early. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, for hosting. And um, thank you everybody for, for, I think, a really in, interesting developer meeting. And uh, hopefully I'll see everybody at the next uh, developer meeting.